न्यूज फर्स्ट फेस टू फेस विद जयमाल रत्नायक गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू टू नाइट्स एडिशन ऑफ फेस टू फेस कमिंग टू यू फ्रॉम आर न्यूज फर्स्ट स्टूडियोज हियर इन कलाबो Tonight my guest is Kabir Hashim member of parliament representing the Samagi Chanabala Vega the main opposition in Sri Lanka a very good evening to you Mr Hashim and thank you for joining me on the show evening jamal Mr Hashim i want to kick start our conversation this evening focusing on Sri Lanka's economy because as you and i know and our viewers will also be aware the sjb has an economic road map that it presented several months ago named the blueprint and you yourself including dr harsha de silva and parliamentarian iran vikramaratna got together and formed the base of creating and formulating the blueprint so i want to touch on the economy and the economic aspect of things first with you because you say that your economic policy and the framework that the sjb envisages is vastly different from what is currently in place so shall we start off tonight's conversation with a small opinion or a prognosis on that yes uh, i i suppose we are perhaps the uh, one of the few parties or perhaps the only party that mm. very clearly defines our economic policy right and we talk about uh, political in politically we are social we believe in social democracy yes and our economic uh, policy program is uh, uh, social ma- uh, social market economy when mm. you talk about a social democracy mm. it's a new concept you know you can define it uh, in a sense that you work within a capitalist framework right but in a capitalist framework where you have selected government intervention where necessary to ensure that there is no oligopoly there is no monopolistic markets mm. where markets fail to work that there is government intervention to ensure that there is equality right, right? Mm. and uh, to ensure that there is uh, 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 a sense of of fairness and okay. a, a level playing field right uh, unlike and in the, when you take come to the economic policy again the uh, a social market economy is as different to the liberal market economy which mm. in a sense has failed in the west today mm. from the us onwards right and uh, you see huge disparities in in terms of economic growth and development yes. and in in this case in the social market economy mm. we have a system where we can ensure that there is a fair distribution and where government intervention is necessary. necessary but we believe in the market economy we believe in private enterprise and we are very clear about that so uh, in that sense we can be we are very clear about our economic policy we don't say one thing in the morning and one another thing in the night like most people you would see today uh, uh, in the political field mm. so we speak about social democracy which is what the blueprint <coughs> is based on i want to talk to you about income distribution in sri lanka or wealth distribution late last year a undp report revealed a very startling fact it said that sri lanka is included in the list of countries in south asia exhibiting the highest wealth inequality and it went on to say that the richest 10% command over half of total income so this is very clearly an indicator that our economy is not sustainable so what sort of a solution does the sjb have in hand to this matter yes which you're quite right because that that the data you spoke about if you really look at it it's not that 10% of the people own 50% of the assets of this country the wealth of this country but 1% of the people in this country own 30% of 30%. the wealth of this country that's as bad as it gets right. and i think we have one of the highest in the south asian region mm. and if we don't address this then uh, you know uh, w- what would happen the result would be social instability right. and yes. and for for that purpose we as much as we want to promote businesses uh, we need to take care of this uh, income distribution issue mm. so in, in that is why that that is why we think that we should work on more direct taxes than indirect taxes mm. indirect taxes are regressive right. the vat uh, imposition of vat excessively mm. results in people in in unequal burdening right because 
the ordinary man pays the same as what a billionaire would pay. Yes. And most often that's not fair because the ordinary man uses more money on food mm. and other items, con mm. consumables rather than a rich person. The, even the IMF, IMF never spoke to the government about how it should raise the taxes. It only gave them targets. It said you have to raise the taxes this year to 12% mm. of mm. GDP. Mm. And one of the suggestions IMF made was to impose, to think about reimposing wealth tax, which right. was taken away in 1990s, then gift tax mm. and inheritance tax. So there, very clearly, there were methods by which the government could have could have raised taxes. If anybody says that you don't have to charge taxes, then that's a myth, right? Yes. That's you can't do that. Mm. The country needs the government revenues have to go up. Mm. It has to be to, uh, up to 20 percent. Uh, of GDP. Yes. And that was the level we had in 1994 when the UNP government was in power. Okay. That's how it was handed over. Mm. So, but who is going to take this burden? How mm. is this burden going to be shared mm. is the important thing. Right. You can't land the burden on the general public or yes. the ordinary man and yes. let that 1% or that 10% you spoke mm. about who commands the majority of the wealth in this country, you can't let them go free. So there's another thing. There's mm. something called windfall gain taxes, yes. which is imposed across the world. Mm. Even in the UK recently, they imposed a windfall gain tax. They were some people said it would be uh, it would be a uh, uh, problem mm. that some of the investors might move out. Right. But at the same time, sh the Shell Company and BP British Petroleum were investing mm. in the US. And when they were questioned about the windfall gain tax. They said their investments are not going to change. Right. So if you think businesses will fall if you tax the rich, mm. that is, I think, uh, um, uh, not correct. Mm. So, for example, during the during the uh, crisis mm. and subsequently in the aftermath of the crisis, the government issued uh, bonds, right? Yes. Uh, treasury bonds ISPs. up to the value of 1.9 mm. trillion, mm. and. That was the time the government needed the money. They paid an excessive interest rate, 27 mm. percent, for a couple of years. Yes. And there were many people, the banks, there were people who invested. Mm. The, the interest they paid to those, about a few primary dealers and mm. banks, is something like 515 billion a year. But there has, they have not been subject to restructuring in their debt. Mm. They have not been subject to any taxes. So you can, you can spread that tax out. That yes. windfall gain tax can be obtained. Mm. And uh, then the withholding tax. There right. are, there's so much of, without putting pressure mm. on people who are investing and who are, who are actually growing the economy, mm. right? Without being unfair, yes. you can raise revenue from this group. This is, you know, there's no time to tell everything, yes. but this is in addition mm. There is a huge number of people who are getting tax breaks, tax holidays mm. unfairly, mm. using political power. There are sectors that are given uh, tax concessions. There are foreigners, foreign mm. companies even now mm. being given tax concessions. If you bring all that into the net, I don't think Sri Lanka is going to have a revenue problem. It's about efficiency, the methods. Mm. And the SJB thinks the government is very inefficient in this uh, the collection of taxes, yeah. mm. and we think we can make that change without burdening the people. Uh, so since you since you mentioned bringing everyone into the net, the IRD being inefficient has been called out many a times, even before Sri Lanka's crisis struck. And uh, taxes, fiscal consolidation, and so on is vital for Sri Lanka's economy to be revived because the government does need revenue to run. However. When we talk about the IRD and the taxes evaded, like you correctly mentioned, there are certain sectors that have evaded paying their taxes. If you see certain uh, alcohol companies, certain casinos, certain big companies, corporations that have been evading their taxes. And there have also been scams. If I take for an example, the sugar scam, we are yet to recover the money that we lost from that. So what sort of a mechanism does the SJB have in place to make the IRD more efficient and ensure that there is a proper and systematic tax collection mechanism and also to recover the money that Sri Lanka has lost through all of these camps? Well, I'm not going to mince my words. Very, very, uh, very few people want to talk about things that are difficult. Mm. But some of the most uh, corrupt institutions uh, in our country is one the customs right. and one the uh, inland revenue department mm. for various reasons and in fairness in the 2001 four 
UNP government. Mm. They tried to change, bring in, digitalize the whole revenue collection, Process. but there was union pressure. Right. And there's a, there's a kind of a mafia that holds on to this and does in the lobby. Okay. You need to break through this. I don't think this government has the will because in the last one year, they haven't done anything to mm. make the change. We think about establishing a single window revenue authority because okay. that is critical mm. for promoting investments, exports in this country because when you get exporters getting hassled when they have to import their raw materials, etc. Et yes. And that becomes a big issue. And the IRD, the uh, Inland Revenue Department, mm. one of the key issues is under Mahindra Rajapaksa's government, they spent over 12 billion rupees on setting up a software system, the Ramis uh, software system. Mm. Up to now, it's not being used. It's used partially, then, it, then they say it's not linked to all the other connected agencies, nor are the files all loaded onto the system. Right. Now, when we brought this issue up to parliament in the public accounts committee, there were promises, there was various things, but, the, but what we feel is the Indian Revenue Department has some people, there are, there are good officers mm. who are trying to do the right thing, but there are some people who's, who are sabotaging this because when you don't have the software working, then you can do the files manually and that's the opportunity for an officer mm. to do a deal with a client, yes. right? Or with a taxpayer. Mm. You have to get the software working, you have to make sure that everything is on HS codes, on digitalization. And once you get that moving, the revenues are going to, I mean, move much higher. And people who are exempted, people who have been avoiding taxes will come into the net automatically. So one of the things that we have focused on mm. is to uh, modernize and bring this single uh, window revenue authority ASAP. Right. And through that, you can in the future de reduce indirect taxes as well because government of revenue course, will yeah, keep going yeah, up regardless. Yes. The, yeah. The, the equality of taxes. Taxes are... Uh, usually taxes are implemented f with two key objectives. Mm. One objective is income to the government. The other key objective is redistribution of income. Mm. And if you forget the second objective, you're going to have a society that's going to be very volatile and, 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 and it's equal. going to react. Mm. And it's going to react and it's going to burst. Yes. And right now, the people who have wealth, it's mm. not about us taking the wealth, but if you don't do that, if you don't have some system of redistribution and fairness, this system is going to collapse. Mm. So you have to take that. And that's why in any capitalist economy, there are uh, things like the, the windfall gain tax, yes. the super taxes, mm. where, which are charged. And those are the monies that needs to be redistributed, right? right? And that's quite fair. And the, it, it, but definitely it must not hinder mm. the the incentive to invest an investor must not so feel you that, have that, to strike that, that a yes, perfect you have to balance strike there. a balance mm. you need to know how to do that and that's about governance yes and i think the sjb has a team that can do that right so moving from taxes to another key area that uh, has grabbed the attention of even the imf is uh, state owned enterprises and how they are inefficient they are underperforming and they are loss making so on and the government has taken several measures to restructure these state owned enterprises including sri lanka telecom elitro gas sri lanka insurance corporation and so on but one thing that does come to mind and a concern that many have raised is if you take sri lanka telecom these are all state-owned enterprise. These are all enterprises that are actually profit-making, but yet the government plans on divesting its shares. And we saw in the last few days and months or weeks, there have been expressions of interest also to invest in these enterprises. So why do you think, Mr. Hashim, that the government is trying to divest shares of even enterprises that are profit-making and are vital to the economy? in such a manner? Well, just to just go back to history, mm. uh, in the 2005 Mahindra Rajapaksa JVP coalition government, where the JVP also had four ministers, 39 MPs. Yes. In that, from that point onwards, up to 2020, mm. The number of state-owned enterprises increased from 1,045 to 2,150 approximately. Mm -hmm. That's more than double. Right. The losses from that period onwards is something like 1.7 trillion rupees. Mm. 
So, you can see why we are get bankrupt. Right? Yes. Coming back to the question of how do you choose uh, state owned enterprise reforms, I would believe it is not privatization is not the word or the concept that we should think about. It is about restructuring state owned enterprises, reforming them. Mm. There we have seen countries in uh, our own region mm. in Asia, Singapore and Malaysia. In Singapore, they use the Kazana. The, the Temasek system mm. and in Malaysia they use the Kazana system, right. creating a sovereign wealth fund. And that sovereign wealth fund which is held by the government, but the management of all SOEs are outsourced to the right. private sector. It works, works very well. Mm. In Singapore, it works very well. You could uh, emulate some of those uh, systems uh, or we could have our own system, a hybrid system. About private uh, loss making or profit making, it is not a question of whether SOE makes profit or makes losses. Yeah. There are critical SOEs which the government has to manage, manage. like the transport sector, right? Even uh, the power, so and, energy power sector. and energy to an extent. Mm. So, in, in that case, par now see even transport, it mm. is privatized, yes. partially privatized, yes. but the state plays a role. Power, state has to play a role, but there should be private suppliers also to create competition. But in, in case of SLT, SLT is one of the clear success stories of a privatization venture done in 19, uh, uh, 94, 95. Yes. Right. In, in India, I just listened to a program in India before 1991, before the change of Narasimh Rao. Right. India changed after that reform of open market. Mm. It used to take eight years to get a telephone before 1991, in the 1980s. In Sri Lanka, it would take 10 years. Yes. When they did the Sri Lanka Telecom reform, mm. Sri Lanka Telecom was a success story. If you look at Sri Lanka Telecom, why their technology is up is because, I think it is Nippon, right? Uh, the Ch Japanese company yes. that came in mm. is one of the top uh, companies with technology. They mm. brought that technology and lifted Sri Lanka Telecom. Sri Lanka Telecom survived so long because of that infusion of Japanese technology. It mm. was not just a fly-by-night investor, it yes. was a good investor. Mm. Even now the unions are saying, okay, you want to, it is not about the profits. If you want to make may, more profits, maybe you can bring a private partner in, yes. but it, ca it must be a proper procurement process. Mm. It must not be a fly-by-night operator exactly. who comes in, buys over Sri Lanka Telecom, mm. makes all the money here, takes, takes the money out of Sri Lanka, right, repatriates the profits, does not bring any technology, no knowledge drives sharing either. it down, no knowledge mm. sharing, then it is an absolute failure. Mm. So, the government must know to choose mm. the partner. Right. If it is such a high stake, if it is a profit making company, then there must be justification why you are doing that privatization. Mm. For example, you might be, you might think that we are making the return on investment yes. might be a percentage, but that if you actually bring a effective and efficient partner, you can double your return on investment. Right. That is what the, how the government should think. Mm. But I am afraid, I am, I am not too sure, I, I saw in the newspapers about two or three investors who had bid. Who had, yeah, I, I really interest. didn't, I do not know I, whether they are top names in uh, telecom technology. Mm. I did not feel so. Yeah. Right? And so my fear is I do not know whether it is just a sellout. So, so th are, these are, are key certain. things that, you know, the transparency, the process, mm. uh, because the, the IMF in its good governance diagnostics has very clearly said that all these procurements should be listed in the uh, on on so uh, what you call on the net right and it must be available to, to people the general public. so that we could be able to see who's investing what's the profile of that company mm. are they capable of taking this and if not the government shouldn't go ahead right so does you, do you mean to say that the sjb will not hold on to power of all state owned enterprises but it will seek to venture out into joining public private partnerships with investors and also do so in a more transparent way because one problem like you mentioned we have is the opacity of all of these deals and all of these agreements like a fly-by-night agreement or an investment. So how will the SGB go about finding these genuine investors Mr. Hashim because we have heard of several investors and those are the same names that swirl around multiple industries as well and that has made the general public lose confidence in the government and the investments that are coming in. So what is the SJB's plan to attract the genuine investors that you mentioned that invested in Sri Lanka long ago? 
like I mentioned earlier, we've been already studying the models on which Singapore mm. did their reforms of their state-owned enterprises, how Malaysia went about theirs. Yes. And we're thinking of a hybrid model between both mm. of uh, uh, implementing the SOE reforms based on that. Right. So it might not be, we are not talking about privatization. Mm. It's not about selling. It's about restructuring and reforming and looking at the government playing a silent partner role, but right. outsourcing the management, okay. right? And have profit sharing with uh, a private sector. private sector. There are so many models. That's one. Number two is we are looking, we're very, we're going to be very strict about the procurement process. Mm. We've been fighting for this even now to implement it before even we take power, right? Not to make promises and wait. Yes. That, that all procurements must be in the public domain. Mm. All uh, uh, government transactions must be through a procurement process and it must be transparent mm. and it also must be accountable. So we, if we adhere to these two policies, we believe that we will be able to reform it because I, I too believe that the government should not be in business. The government mm. should be in the business of ruling or governing a country, mm. but not doing business because we've seen what the government has done with business, yes. right? It's been an absolute failure. Mm. Um, even with the CEB bill, which is a very controversial bill, right, about CEB be, being unbundled. Yes. If the CEB was unbundled in 2004 when it was originally proposed, CEB wouldn't have lost the billions of dollars that it did lose. And the CEB, if you look at what happened, mm. there's a mafia of uh, engineers who get together and uh, they make money. The right? They're manipulator and who, who bears the brunt of mm. it? the ordinary people of this country. I mean, why, why should they pay for their sins? So if there is competition and somebody is going to give power at a cheaper rate than the government, so be it. Mm. What's wrong? Right? But in terms of the, the control about uh, unfair tariffs, now we are, we are studying the bill. We see there are some issues in the bill right. where the minister will have excessive power, mm. too much power to where he could manipulate the rates Yes. The the, uh, the the power, the electricity rates, mm. etc., mm. which shouldn't happen. Which should be through uh, 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 a commission, commission, right? Yes. So that's what An we are looking at. Commission. Yeah, independent commission. So the there should be a proper utilities commission set mm. up that has the power to control it. So if those safeguards are in place, mm. and if there is a process for everything which is transparent, mm. then I believe that uh, people are not going to. Uh, worry too much about it. But if it's going to be like, you know, uh, in the name of privatization, if ministers and governments are going to make money, money and they're going to put deals, then definitely no. And the SJB is not going to stand for that. Everything will be specified through processes. That's why I said we don't call it uh, privatization or selling out. We, mm. we are talking about restructuring mm. them. And restructuring is totally different. And we are thinking of where the government holds in certain cases, holds ownership, but uh, outsources management. Right. So, from one thing to the other, I want to move on to uh, a section or a sector that was most affected initially through COVID-19 and also through our economic crisis is the small, medium, uh, medium scale enterprises in Sri Lanka, the SME sector. There were so many entrepreneurs, there were so many businessmen and women who had to shut down their shops because they were unable to pay back their loans, the moratoriums weren't, weren't granted on time or they were unable to pay back, they were unable to procure certain uh, goods or ingredients to keep their shops running. And this is something that has created another major crisis because this directly impacts Sri Lanka's economy and its production overall. So what sort of a plan does the SJB have? to uplift the SME sector in Sri Lanka, to allow Sri Lankan manufacturers, Sri Lankan brands to take on the world, to create an image for themselves in the global marketplace. Tell me about that as well. Yes, well, uh, lots of people will talk about magic uh, answers. There are no magic answers. We are a bankrupt country. Mm. We are least competitive in the region. Uh, we have lots of bureaucratic laws yes. that and we are closed up, right? We need to become competitive. Mm. Number one is to make our companies, our SME sector competitive. Yes. You can't uh, 
uh, subsidize companies and keep them alive. Okay? So, we believe that we need to make them competitive. Mm. We need to be able to start off with uh, finance at competitive rates. Mm. Our interest rates are way above yes. what uh, any uh, business can uh, bear. bear. Yes. And how would you ask them? So, one of, that's one of the biggest problems. But that's, that's because of the crash, right? Um, consistently, we've been telling the government to restructure the debt. And if, if, if they say banks have a problem, then they have to figure uh, out a way either to recapitalize the banks or yes. figure the banking problem separately. Mm. But two years ago, the World Bank pumped in some money on concessionary rates. Yes. We tracked it. I tracked it personally. Mm. And the central bank annual report of 2022, I think, mm says that those monies didn't reach the SMEs. Instead, the banks, the main banks, yes. through their branches, mm. they instead lent it to their favorite customers where they gave the concessionary uh, rate, rate and just gave them a few of their friends, right? Mm. But the SMEs didn't get the money. Now, again, after fighting, we, the opposition leader, met with the ADB. We were at that meeting and the ADB is pumping in $200 million. Yes. Again, to be, support, the again to support the SME. It's up to the government to take that responsibility to see that the monies go to where it's needed mm. to drive this SME sector because it's key. Mm. Because the IMF has fixed our, to an extent, supported the macroeconomic stabilization right. by bringing in fiscal policy yes. and uh, monetary policy. Mm. But that's how much the IMF can do. And we need, within its framework, mm. the IMF tells the government that it should now stimulate its microeconomy. Mm -hmm. And that the IMF can't do, that the government has to do. Yes. So the government has to figure out to support them with the credit, mm. because that's one of the biggest problems, because they can't repay their loans now. And their uh, loans are not being restructured. Yes. They're not getting concessionary mm -hmm. finance. The concessionary finance that's available is going into the pockets of selected mm -hmm. customers of the favorites of the banks. And you're talking about helping our banks. I mean, the banks are, I mean, actually they're exploiting people most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then, on the other hand, the cost of power has gone up. The cost of uh, fuel. oil, fuel mm -hmm. has gone up. And they have to pay more for their workers because of the cost of living. And these companies are finding it very difficult. Now, this is where the government needs to stimulate. If they need to stimulate the microeconomic sector, they need to strengthen the SMEs. Mm. So what we are looking at is definitely uh, finances at low interest rates. Right? right? If it has to be through develop, development finance, then we have to figure a way out because it's critical. Mm. Then technology, because these companies need to be competitive and linking them. That's why we are thinking about the global value chain. It's right. critical that you link the SME sector with the world market. Mm. And the, uh, if you look at the global value chain, no product in the world is manufactured in one country. No, it's manufactured in all components yes. are manufactured in different parts. Mm. And intim intermediary products, industrial products, mm. are the growing factor. It's actually 60% of all exports from the Asian countries mm. are intermediary products, yes. that machinery parts, mm. uh, digital uh, parts, electronic CPUs, parts, GPUs, CPUs, yes. etc. And mm. we, if you look at the growth in terms of countries like uh, uh, South Korea, they are the, the percentage of exports in intermediary parts is 53%. In Vietnam, it is around 52%, mm. right? In Sri Lanka, our intermediary part exports is like 5%. And if you look at these countries, they are exports to China from these countries like Korea mm. have increased by 100% since 2014 up to now from from like from 12% to 25%. Mm. But Sri Lanka, from the time the Mahindra Rajapaksa government came to power up to now, our exports to China has been just 2%, has not increased by 0.1%. Mm. So that shows where we are. So we need to do this linkage and for these SMEs to be able to f feed into the global value chain. Right. And for these companies that set up to export to uh, have a backward linkage with the market. So we are looking at how we create that space. You know, you know, you need to fix a lot of things to yes. get the export market going. Yes. It's not so easy. This yeah. is not magic either. 
you have the the epz's have to be set up land issues are there ease of doing business yes. trade facilitation uh, and uh, trade agreements mm. all this has to come into play but we are ready to do that because we have already mapped out mapped out our plan we are going to hit the road running and we are just waiting for Until government to secure the power yep the road is mapped out they are ready to hit the road running all they require is your vote to come into power that is the message from member of parliament kabir hashim representing the samangi jana balavegya who joined me this evening on face to face on a very economy centric conversation i thank you once again for joining me this evening mr hashim thank you thank you and that's how it was on face to face tonight do take care and have yourself a great night